Good evening. But first, I'd like to give thanks to the Lord for the honor and the blessing to be with you tonight and to, uh, for being able to share this moment of Lent. And before I begin, I'd like to share with you the word of the Lord, whatever the Lord wants to lead us. And I'm reading to you from Ephesians uh, 2 11. Christ is our peace. Remember that you were pagans even in your flesh, and the Jews who called themselves circumcised because of a surgical circumcision call you uncircumcised. At that time you were without Christ. You did not belong to the community of Israel. The covenants of God and His promises were not for you. You had no hope and were without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus and by His blood, you who were once far off have come near. For Christ is our peace. He who has made the two peoples one, destroying his own flesh, the wall, the hatred, which separated us. He abolished the law with his commands and precepts. He made peace in uniting the two peoples in him, creating out of the two one new man. He destroyed hatred and reconciled us both to God through the cross, making the two one body. He came to proclaim peace. Peace to you who were far off, peace to the Jews who were near. Through him, we, the two peoples, approach the Father in one spirit. For those that don't know my conversions, I give you an idea of why I'm here. I, I am um, from Colombia. I was born there and I, I was part of a Catholic family. I grew up in a Catholic family in the countryside, coffee growers town. And uh, when I was a teenager, at age 14, I was sent to Bogota, the capital, to finish my high school education. Those were the 1960s. And since then, I walked away from the faith for 33 years. And I went to school at the University of Hamburg in Germany, lived there for a little over six years, and then I moved to this country, to California, and engaged myself in the entertainment industry. I am an actor and a musical composer. And in the year 97, while I was visiting Colombia in Christmas, I was abducted, I was kidnapped by the rebels, the guerrillas, and they took me captive. I spent six months in the jungle, sentenced to death, and on the terrifying conditions, and on the 15th day, while I was being kept in a cave, I had experience with God that lasted all night long. And that was a mystical experience where I went through practically what I could call the uh, trial of my life before the Lord. So after I was released miraculously from that ordeal of the kidnapping, I went back to California, went back to the church, kept the whole experience in silence for two years, not knowing that I had a calling from the Lord. And two years later, during the Holy Week, I had experience with Jesus in a church on Palm Sunday in Bogota, Colombia. And the Lord showed me clearly what He wanted from me. And uh, He showed me that I was actually born for this mission that was going to start, and I was 49 years old then. Since then, I founded a mission called Pilgrims of Love, and I have been traveling the world for 11 years. Last Christmas, I had already visited 90 countries in the five continents, and that's what I do constantly. I, um, I could only say that I couldn't be happier in my life. My life is a very different life than the life I had because I was after things of the world all these years that I went away from God, that I was falling away from the church. And uh, when I had this mystical experience, my change was so radical, so enormous, that I could say that I am like a new human being and only because of the mercy of God. So I'm here today to share this moment of reflection uh, during this Lent 
um, because I feel that within the mystery of our faith we have gifts that are practically undiscovered to us to a great extent and one of them is uh, Lent. We have a magnificent precious gift, the gift of Lent where God gives us such an incredible opportunity to really understand what we are all about and what faith is all about and our relationship with Him and the uh, fragility and vulnerability of this transitory life, how vulnerable it is and how short it is and how important it is to understand that we are to become a spiritual for real and that is not only just a theological presentation of life, it is a fact of life where we are called to really live spiritually. And the reason I have a passion to speak about being a spiritual is because my experience with God led me to see beyond the veil of this material world, to see that it is a reality that life goes on, that there is a life that is just actually going to begin in its fullness after we are departing from this one. And this is just the beginning. And we have a precious gift, the gift of life. And it's so precious. And we still don't see it as it is because we go through these incredible trials and toils and tribulations of this temporary life. And our mortality is a big weight on us. And it takes away a lot of the attention into what awaits us at the end of this life in Jesus Christ, the promises and all these incredible revealed truths that we have in the church. And still, I personally insist that what I have seen uh, leads me to go around the world telling people to wake up. Not because I have anything new to say, because everything I'm saying, you know it. But the thing is that I believe that we human beings become, in such a strange way, sort of indifferent to some realities that are so transcendental, like to understand that we have to prepare to die every day. And those things we let go by, and we do not even deal with it. And things like that are very important to keep in mind, to keep it present. I know that as good Catholics that you are, you probably know many lives of the saints and you know that, that so many of them um, emphasize so much the importance of understanding that today is the day and the only one we have and therefore today is the day to prepare for everything, to prepare to see the Lord, to prepare for as if it was the only day we have and, and when we come to Lent we come to an understanding of a special grace. We know that the church has powers to bind things on earth and whatever is bind on earth is bound in heaven. That is the power Jesus gave Peter and that is the church. So that's why through Lent the church has the power to give us the special gift of reconciliation which comes and pours out of God's graces the most amazing opportunity to understand what we need to do at this moment of our lives in order to move on uh, into a level where we can really see how much we need to change. And it's, it's very important to realize how much of a religious person we are and how much of a spiritual person we are. Because the danger of being only religious is that we might think that we are okay because we are religious. And then we forget that we have to build and a spirituality on our religion. Our religion is the foundation of, uh, of this whole doctrine that God gave us in order to build ourselves as a spiritual person, as a spiritual beings. And the calling is to become spiritual. And we, we hear this in every sermon, we hear this almost in every word that is read from the scriptures, in every mass, and we hear this in all kinds of reflections that we have about our faith. But the thing is that how much of these are we taking into our bones, into our flesh, into our blood, into our little life, little human life? Because our minds are so enormously creative and, and they have so much capacity 
to bring in all kinds of information and we delight on this information and we store it because we have so much space to store it and at the end very few of that information, very little of that just sink in and, and comes in, into action and it is very important to, to understand during this season of Lent how much of this religion of ours is actually coming inside, is actually walking with us, is actually turning into the force that it needs to turn into, the force that will change the heart, the force that will really renew us, the force that will show us what is wrong and where we have to do, what we have to do in order to make it right. And especially like thinking today where we are at, we will say, if I was to review my heart tonight, and I will, I, will to, I will be thinking as to what is the most important thing in my life tonight. What, it is, what is the most important thing? You see, if you were to die tonight, and in your heart the most important thing is a human being, money, your, your concerns and worries about this life, and your goals, your frustrations, your fears, and so many other things that humanly occupy our life. If, if one of those things is the, is the key of your, of your priorities, then you are in trouble because God is calling us to have God as the one, the treasure. And he should, he's, he's to be the one, the first one in everything. Because we read in the scriptures that it says, wherever your treasure is, your heart is. And when we die, our heart will go to where our treasure is. And what is our treasure tonight? We have to find out because you see the beginning of our faith is the first commandment. We have to be there. First commandment is first and everything else comes after. And then if God is not first, then we are not focused on salvation. We are not focused on the citizenship that was granted to us of the city of light, the city of Jerusalem. We belong there. We were given the home that, that God the Father gave us through Jesus. And if we are not focused on this reality, we are not aiming right and we could end this life tonight. You see, sometimes I tell people, if you want to really have a very deep experience of spirituality, the best place to go is to a funeral. That is a deep experience because that will be your greatest retreat. There are many retreats and with very deep subjects and they go into the depths of the faith and sometimes you walk out of those retreats, renew and probably inspire. But I think the greatest retreat of all is a funeral and especially when you bury a loved one, someone you knew, someone that probably was talking to you just a few hours before or, or a day before and you see it in a casket there. And it's when you go right by the casket, you feel you standing on the edge of something that is so mysterious because you know there is no life in that body, but you know that person is still around. You see, you know that soul is there and something is continuing, that life is going on. But now we have the mystery that we are not connecting temporarily. And we know this, all of this we know. But then the question is, how prepared are we to face that? And when we come to Lent, the biggest calling of the church to us is to understand that fragility, that mortality, and that immortality that God gives us through faith. And then the calling is to embrace immortality and to embrace it by, by letting God work in us in a way that we achieve a spiritual growth that will lead us to understand that the main factor of our spiritual growth is to let the love of God really dwell in us. So the only way we could determine how much of that love is dwelling in us is if we really pinpoint as to how much have I grown into charity, compassion, forgiveness. Am I a better human being than I was the length before, a year ago? Because you see, I think this is, these are the only real questions in our life. If I am a better human being today than I was a year ago, past Lent, 
then I'm walking towards the Lord. I'm going home. I'm a real pilgrim. I'm moving forward with the Lord. And that is something really important because what good does it do if I am so religious when I'm not spiritual? For me to be spiritual, I have to walk my religion and I have to act upon my religion by changing the heart, transforming my life every day. I have to be a better human being all the time because otherwise I am deceiving myself with my own religion. And there is so much of this going on. You can see uh, the contradictions of the faith in some, of pe in some people. Some people are very religious, but you know they are miserable. They don't have joy, they don't have peace, and they are always in church. They are always practicing the faith in a religious fashion. But they don't seem to have the peace, they don't seem to have the joy, and they don't have charity and compassion. And sometimes a, lo a hard time forgiving. And you wonder how could that be possible for someone that is so prayerful, for someone that appears to be so close to God. And what happens is that there is so much religion and very little spirituality. So the world is lacking spirituality today. And I'm talking about the world of the believers because obviously we wouldn't demand spirituality from those that do not know God or are practicing religions that are not of God. But us that we are given, we have been given the gift of, of, of the Spirit of the Lord then we are the ones that are called to really become spiritual so that we can walk with the Spirit of God that has been given to us supernaturally through the sacraments. And this time of Lent is a challenge for us because whether we wake up into being real or we continue being those lukewarm human beings that are just content with religion. And then we fool ourselves because we notice we are not softening up our hearts we are not changing our ways, we are not becoming a better human being, therefore we are stuck. We are not walking, we are not pilgrims, we are not going home to the home of the Father. And that is a tragedy. That's why the Lord is so compass compassionate, the Lord is so merciful, that He gives us the opportunity through the teachings of the Church to bring us, to bring us into these sacred traditions and to teach us how to renew our lives and to start from zero. It's difficult to demolish this great human building we are built in. We have so many ideas. We are so intelligent. Some of us are so prepared and so educated and so structured. And we have so many avenues of, of thoughts and, and so many uh, challenges that we have. And then at the end, all of that could become a big obstacle because that will build us into a self-sufficiency, a self-centeredness, a selfishness that will take us away from the truth, which is so simple. Because the truth is so simple. It doesn't take a great preparation. It takes a great decision. That's what it does. It's not about thinking a lot. It's about doing it. And it's like giving up advice. It's not about thinking how to do it. It's about doing it. And you have to like amputate it. It's, that's the way you go about things you have to uproot from your life. And one of the things that we are called to do in order to bring about a real change in our lives is to bring up that decision and take and, and, and just chop everything that has to be taken away from us. Everything that has to be chased away from our lives, the darkness that we are carrying because of disobedience, because all these bad habits, all these bad tendencies, all this, uh, the sloth, the spirit of sloth that is so common in the world today, because we, we are striving for comfort all the time. We are trying to stay away from pain. We are trying to stay away from suffering. And, and that is... It's, it's a hindrance for our spiritual growth because in that searching for comfort, that searching for success, that searching for prosperity, that searching for physical health, that searching for everything to go well, that becomes like an obsession. And it's the only goal and it's the only thing that appears to be attractive and interesting. And then everything else that comes along, suffering, disease, all kinds of trials and tribulations in these lives, are taken as a tragedy, as a curse, as something that shouldn't happen. And that's what kills us, because we are to live 
with the good winds and the tough winds. And we are navigating. We are not uh, navigating through a sea that is just calm. It's, just, it's a sea that moves and is alive. And we have to cross the good waters and the bad waters. And we have the tough winds and the soft winds, the calm weather and the tough weather. And we have to deal with all of that with compassion, with joy, with peace, with hope, with trust. But we cannot expect everything to be the same all the time and to expect to be comfortably living, abundantly living and receiving all these gifts of prosperity in this, uh, in this material world because otherwise we feel everything is going wrong in our lives. And that, that comfort is just a spirit of sloth. That's what it is. It's, it's nothing else than that. People that strive for comfort and they strive for goodness in, in everything that they do in their lives are not wrong because God wants to give us that. God wants to grant us a good life also. But the thing is that if that is your only goal and that is the only thing that makes you happy and that is the only way you are peaceful and joyful when things are working well in your life, then you are hitting wrong because God wants you to be prosperous. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be happy. But for you to enjoy those times when that happens, you have to understand also that God is molding us, is teaching us, is bringing us to a much higher gift, the gift of eternal life. And temporary life is a school of souls. We are being molded here. This is the place where we were born. This is the beginning of a journey that will never end. And therefore, the hands of, of the potter are on the clay. And he's twisting and turning our soul, our soul so that we can be in shape at the end of this life. And when we emerge out of this flesh into the fullness of the spiritual world, we can actually go into the ocean of God and be with him eternally in his glory. And that is the preparation. So contradictions in this life are the biggest obstacle for our salvation. Because when we demand to understand all the absurdities of this temporary life, then we are stuck because we are filled with anger, we are depressed, we are confused, we are frustrated, and therefore we give up. And that's what kills people and destroys them and stops them from growing spiritually. But when you are little, humble, simple, obedient to God, in spite of it all, regardless of what takes place in this life, regardless of how absurd this temporary life may appear to be, you still are not confused, you are, you are obedient, you don't understand, you, but you love. It's like you, you pick the apostle of love, St. John, and you notice how he managed to go through with Jesus through Calvary, and he walked along with him. If someone knew that that was God, it was St. John. He knew Jesus was God. He was with him in the mount, mountain where he transfigured and became God and many other reasons and, and he didn't understand a thing while he was going to Calvary. He didn't get it. He couldn't understand how God would let his own creatures do what they were doing to him. That could, he couldn't possibly understand it. But he loved him and his love for his master kept him going along with him. And that is the calling of God to us. If we love unconditionally God, then we don't question what is going on. Because what is going on is absurd. You look at this world, it will never make sense. It will never make sense to us. This world, by the way, is imperfect. And we have to remember that. This body is imperfect. If it will, I mean, it's so imperfect, it dies. So this life is imperfect because it's temporary. It couldn't be perfect. If it will be perfect, it will be eternal. But so, therefore, we couldn't possibly demand to understand imperfection. There's no way we could. Because in us, there is something that is perfect and eternal, our soul. And therefore, we have this duality in us. St. Paul calls it, that it's like a fight between the flesh and the spirit. It seems like they're going one against the other. Because one understands etern the eternal sense of life, and the other one doesn't. And then one goes against the other. So Christ came to be the peace between the two. 
Christ came to be the mediator between flesh and spirit and to teach us how to deal with the two and to be in harmony and to be coherent about it. How? Look at the contradictions of his earthly life. His, his life on earth, the 33 years, are so contradictory because just the, the people that were around him, obviously they didn't have the Holy Spirit, but some people today, in spite of the Holy Spirit, still are behaving worse than the ones that didn't have it that were around them, than the apostles. They were in awe because they were expecting him to be the king on earth, to bring in all the goods and the powers, to just dominate the world and to take over the powers and to just free them from the Romans and straighten the Jews and do all of these things. And, and that's what we expect all the time because we are striving for human powers and human success. And we want this temporary life to be the life, the life that makes it, the life that is going to provide all the amazing success in everything we do. And that destroys us because the world is teaching us that. The world is teaching us to conquer the world. That's what the world is teaching us. Everything we read, everything we, we learn, everything we, we, we are attracted to in this temporary life is the world teaching us to conquer it. And, and what God is teaching us is completely the opposite. It's telling us the world is not to be conquered. God is to be conquered by faithfulness. Eternal life is your calling, not temporary life. That's why Jesus, when he was before Pontius Pilate, he said very clearly, my kingdom is not of this world. And he said it. And then when we call ourselves Christians, that means we belong to Christ, and if we belong to Christ, where is his kingdom? It's not of this world. And, and today, reflecting on Lent, we know about the temptations in the desert, and one of the temptations tells us something very powerful about what I'm just saying. When, when, when the Spirit of the Lord was taken to the mountain by the devil, and he was shown all the powers on earth, and, and Satan told him that all of this has been given to me. If you kneel and adore me, I will give them to you. You see, that tells you everything. Jesus told us, the prince of this world is Satan. And then St. John says, the whole world is in the hands of the devil. Then the Lord says, you do not belong here. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. I came here to teach you how to understand where you belong to. You belong to me. You were given to me by the Father. And I'm preparing a place for you. I'm going before you to prepare a place for you. That's why I have to go. And I, if I, when I go, I'm going to send you the paraclete. And he will give you company every day of your life. And will lead you the way and teach you and teach you what to do. And that is what we have today. So the church is leading us through the liturgy. And here we have Lent. And Lent is a very special gift. Sadly enough, traveling through the church, as I do, I notice how in some places in the church, the sacraments are watered down because they, they are, there is such a liberal approach to the sacraments today that some Catholic churches are just like Protestant halls. They have lost the sense of the sacraments and they teach in heresies and they just make mocking sacred traditions and making fun of doctrine. And just, they build up their own church, their own religion, their own doctrine. They have no obedience to church hierarchy and they live on their own, their own Christianity. And, it's, and they call themselves Catholics. And it's a tragedy because when you, when you look at life from, from the, the real perspective of the gospel, the way it's written, you find passages like St. Paul saying, even if an angel from heaven comes and changes one word of the gospel, fire him. And he explains very clearly how we couldn't possibly change anything that God has taught us. You know, everything that is in the gospel is the way it's written. That is the way it is. God's law could never be negotiated, could never be changed. Everything Everything is going to come to pass and to be changed, but no word of God will come to pass. And then, if we understand that, how could 
one go against what is written. And you sometimes hear from the very pulpit in the church people preaching heresies and preaching things that are not even written in the scriptures that are against the law of God. And these are the times we live in. So that's why when we come to church, we have to know who we are. We have to study our faith. We have to understand our doctrine. We have to realize the gospel. And we have to bring it close to our chest. We cannot let any weird and funny theologies take over our hearts. Just because of people of authority are teaching it, that doesn't mean it's true. doesn't mean. You have to double check it. You have to compare everything to what is being revealed to us. And we have to be obedient to sacred tradition, to the same doctrine. We have to be obedient to hierarchy. We have to understand that God is perfectly speaking to us through the church. And that what has been established as our doctrine, our faith, is a reality that is going to give us the light on the path we have to walk on. It's, there's no negotiating on that. So one of the greatest commitments in Lent is to understand how important it is to become a simple parishioner, a simple Catholic, a basic believer, which means not to be a creative one. You see, today we have so much information, so much is going on, that people are picking from everywhere. And at the end, they are so confused because they don't know who to listen, because there are too many voices are talking to us. And a lot of them are talking to us in the name of the Lord. And the Lord said to us, there's going to come a time when they're going to come from everywhere. And they're going to tell you Jesus is here, Jesus is there. And they're going to be talking about him in every corner. And he said, don't go there because I'm not going to be there. And where did he tell us that he was going to be? He is going to be here, right in the Blessed Sacrament. That is his place. He is here. God gave us everything already. And as Catholics, we have the greatest gift. You know, when you see the people of God going through the desert, and you see that tribe of Levi, the descendants of Aaron, that were, that were named priests, and they were the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant, the way they guarded the Ark of the Covenant, the, 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 the way they treasure it, and the way they venerate it. Solomon bought, built the greatest temple for the Ark of the Covenant. And, and no one will ever build a temple like that. And they still didn't have what we have. We have today the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The same God that spoke to Moses. Right here. And remember, when this very same God spoke to Moses, no one could even get close to the mountain. The Lord told Moses to build a fence around the base the foot of the mountain, so no one could get near. And if someone would get near, they have to be stunned to death. And, and today, we have a God that is right here, the same God right in the Eucharist. And it's still, a lot of us are roaming around, trying to find the answers everywhere else. So I think that one of the greatest reflections of Lent is to get very, very close to this God that is here in the Eucharist. And to understand that reconciliation is the key to get closer to Him. Reconciliation. The sacrament of confession is the greatest gift because it will, it will enable us to come and embrace this amazing power that is given to us through Jesus' Eucharist. The amazing gift of healing. The amazing gift of holiness because that God that comes in as food to us through that tasteless bread of the host, the Eucharist, is going to strengthen us so that we can love, so that we are able to forgive, so that we are able to be faithful, so that we are able to understand how simple life is when we just follow the Lord. That's why Jesus said, my yoke is light. Those who follow me will have a life that they never dreamt, a life that they could have never conceived, a life that no one could, could create for them, no one could propose it, no one could even imagine it, the life that Jesus is bringing to us if we just follow him in the simplicity of what God has left for us to follow on, which is the church. 
which, are, which is this presence of God right here. And you notice, and probably you all have been to this, how sad it is to see how irreverent people are to the Blessed Sacrament. Temples are mistreated today. People walk into the temples and they behave like they are in a Protestant hall where there is no sacredness, where there is no Blessed Sacrament, where there is no mystic, no sacred traditions in any way. And we have to understand that we have a gift that is beyond anybody's imagination. I was comparing it, saying, just to give an idea, that the people of God from, the, from old, those that were the Jews before Jesus' incarnation, what they did with the Ark of the Covenant, and remember, the Ark of the Covenant was the, 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 was the bar, you know, that, that, uh, that bar of uh, Aaron, that bloom, and then the manna, the sample of the manna, and, the, and those tablets of the Ten Commandments. And, and that was so sacred for them. And it was just a symbology and signs that were leading into the incarnation of Jesus. And look what they did. They, no one could get near. Only the high priest will go once a year to the second altar. And then in, in the, the rest of the year, they will be on the first altar. And they had all this incredible, mysterious treatment of this particular Ark of the Covenant. And God was the one that designed everything for that Ark of the Covenant. So what do we have here? And do we know what we have? And then you see so many people walking in in the temples and not knowing that where they are. Not knowing that when, when God spoke to Moses, the first thing he told him is, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. That's what he said. Imagine, where are we right now? We are on holy ground. We are right in the presence of the same God that spoke to Moses. The same God. And do we know that? Do we understand that? Do we believe that? Some people ask me, could you give me some advice as to what to do during an hour of adoration? I come to adoration and I bring my rosary, I pray a few rosaries, I read the scriptures, I read a little bit of this and that, but then I don't know what to do with the rest of the time. I usually try, I tend to fall asleep. Can you counsel me to do something that will keep me awake? And I say, well, the first thing we have to talk about is this. When you go to visit someone important in your life, sometimes you even buy new clothes. Sometimes you do the greatest preparation to go and see a human being, right? And when you go and visit them, you are wide awake for hours, maybe days, and then you don't even get tired. And how come if you do believe that it is God alive in the Eucharist, the one that created you, and you come for an hour, and you have to find entertainment to be in His presence, and then you have a tendency to fall asleep because you don't know what to do. Do you really believe that that is God that you're visiting? I don't think so. That couldn't be possible, because if you will believe it, you will be almost in ecstasy. You will be in the presence of God. Imagine what it means. So, there is something wrong with our relationship with the Eucharist, obviously. And we're fooling ourselves. So, one of the things I say is this. If you want to be sincere, if you want to be real, if you want to really get down to the nitty-gritty of this reality of the Spirit, go and ask the Lord to give you the real hunger for the Eucharist. I will say, how much of a Catholic are you today? How hungry are you for that bread? How hungry? And how much is it calling you? How, how much do you feel His presence? When you are here sitting in these pews, do you feel His presence? Do you feel God is in front of you? He's sitting at the right side of the Father. And He is this, this Eucharistic God in this tabernacle. And that's His throne. And He's right in front of us. And He's right inside us. And He's all over because he's omnipresent. And do you know that? Do you feel that? Do you understand this mystery? How much are you inside the mystery? And I think if one reflection will be important during Lent, will be that, to be sincere, to be real, and to stop being just a religious human being. And you will see a transformation in your life. You will see that you will discover something you probably haven't discovered yet. You will go above the surface. You will begin to build an edifice of faith. 
an edif an spiritual edifice. And when you build yourself on the spirit, you build yourself on the rock. Because if you're only religious, any wind will blow you away. That's why people walk away from the churches. Because of the scandals of the priests. Because of parishioners. Why? Because they're focused on people. They are just religious people. And then they get disheartened, frustrated, scandalized. But if we focus on God and we understand the mystery of the church, no one is going to be able to confuse us. No one is going to be able to take our faith and hope away. And prepare yourself. You know the big broom of heaven came down to earth and God is sweeping the church. We are just beginning to hear about the scandals in the church. I guarantee you, this is only the beginning. One thing the Lord showed me when I had my mystical experience, and this happened 12 years ago, almost 13 already. And one of the things he showed me was, he was going to clean up his church. And then after the church was cleaned, he was going to do the cleansing of the whole of humanity. See, first he cleans his house, and then he cleans the human family. And th this is not a threat. This is just an invitation to be conscious. And to understand that it's not about being scandalized, it's about straightening up. See, when, when the Lord comes to correct us, that means we are his children. Because if only a father corrects the children. And we should accept his correction humbly. So he's calling our attention and saying, oh yes, a lot of scandals? How about you? You have to straighten up too. You're not as holy as you need to be. You have to straighten up and bring the strength of your holiness to the church. Because now more than ever, we need holy Catholics. Because these are times of testing, times of trials for the church. A lot of people walk away from the church in shame because of what happened. That is the wrong approach. We have to stay because this is our home and we have to defend it. We have to stand the ground of the faith and make sure that no human being is going to be powerful enough to take us away from our home because we are not worshiping people. We have to pray for those that fell. Those are fallen soldiers. All these people that did wrong in the church and created all these scandals, you have to feel for them too. Because the devil got them, you see, during the desert, 40 years, the Hebrews, being the people of God, the chosen ones, were hit by the devil. In one day, over 20,000 were killed by God because they fornicated, because they did this and the other. And then, you see, we are sinners, and some of us are not making it, so we have to have compassion for everyone. But at the same time, we couldn't possibly let those people scandalize us in a way that we will be disheartened and frustrated and deceived and then lose faith and lose our love for the church. That will be a tragedy because then we will be victims of our own weaknesses and lukewarmness and up for being of the flesh and not of the spirit. So these are times when we are really called to be of the spirit more than ever. If you're not a spiritual, what is coming on the church, you're not going to be able to bear it. You're not going to be able to bear it. You're going to see how so many religious communities are going to turn more and more into New Age. How, many, how, how much of the clergy is going to fall into these liberal theologies and we're going to be horrified. But still, you see, God is in the church always because this is his temple. And we are going through seasons. We are going through tough weather. We are going through tough winds. And we have to be good sailors. And in order to be good sailors, we have to just grab the weapons and be faithful to God by, by understanding the sacraments. Those are our weapons. We have to grab them and hold them and trust in God, knowing that they are powerful enough for us to, 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 to go through this and then not to fall and not to get despair or confused and not to lose faith and hope. We have to love one another and understand that it is difficult to be faithful, that it is difficult to stand up and be of God all the time, to be a person that is striving for holiness. It's not as simple. We are in the world, and the world is speaking to us from every corner. All these images, all these visions of the world, all this incredible seduction of the world. And, and we have to fight all of this every day. 
every day. So how are we going to make it? I think that if we understand that original sin is about eating a fruit we shouldn't have eaten, th that's the beginning of the understanding what we're dealing with. We are dealing with a knowledge we are not supposed to have. We, wouldn't, we weren't supposed to know what we know. That's why Jesus said, become like children, little, very little, so that you can enter the kingdom of God. What did he mean by that? He meant it's not about human knowledge. It's not about being so creative. It's not about be, being so thirsty about understanding everything. It's about becoming simple, little. It's about understanding your nothingness. And that way, when you are simple, little, humble, God comes in and then he begins to grow in you and you begin to become smaller and smaller. That is the beginning of true faith. That's why St. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, Jesus who lives in me. St. John the Baptist, I have to diminish so he can grow. Jesus, become little so you can enter the kingdom. In every corner, God is teaching us the lesson and we just don't get it because we try to be these big personas. We try to be these gigantic buildings. We, I mean, our personalities are outrageous. See, people are so gigantic, so large, so intelligent and so important. And it's just devastating because God wants us to demolish this big building. God wants us to really let it go and to understand that it's about nothingness. It's not about this big presence because that is all pride. And pride kills us because pride is the throne of Satan. If you want to know where Satan is, say, Satan is sitting on the throne of pride. That's where Satan is. A proudful person always thinks that is better than others. Always. That's the first sign, you know. You feel that you are of a better family, a better race, more important, more distinguished. If you have the little money or the little credentials or the little titles, the little education, the little advantages over others, you end up thinking you're better. See, that how full, that's how foolish we become. And then we lose God. Because when we build ourselves like that, you even see that in the church. Sometimes in the church you find clergy like that, religious people like that, lay people like that, that they end up thinking they know, that they, they guard the truths and the rest don't have them. And they walk around with the chest up like this, and they, they are like peacocks, you know, walking around. And you say, what are they up to when we are called to be very little vessels of clay. The Lord is calling us to understand who we are. We are creatures created by the Creator, and the Creator is the one. See, God tells Moses his name, and he says, tell them that I am sent you. That's not an easy message, right? Oh, and, and today we think, how many I ams are, are there? There could be only one because there's only one God. So who am I? I'm not, for sure, right? So what is the world teaching us? That I am, see? So we are deceived. That's what happened to Eve. Eve went dropping ears to the serpent and the serpent told her, you are, see? You'll be like God. And then she fell for it. Here we are, that's the consequences. And we still fall for that. We still go for self-esteem and positive thinking, self-realization. That is very attractive. We want that. We want more of that. Oh, yes. All these psychotherapies, all this incredible building of self. Everybody goes for that. It's like you want the formula of success. And those books, they sell millions because everyone wants to build themselves into this great hero. Heroes here and heroes there. They have the t-shirts of their heroes everywhere. And I said, watch out, there is only one hero. Jesus is the hero. He is the only one that conquered death. Show me one of those heroes, positive thinking heroes, and all these heroes of the world. Show me one that was able to overcome death. On one, there is no one. So my real hero, and the only t-shirt I wear, is the t-shirt the of Jesus, because he's the only one that crossed over. The only one that made it to the other side, and then wave at, at us from there. Say, here I am, hey, hello, I didn't die, right? Who can do that? No one has done that. Where are all the heroes of this world? They are all in the cemetery, all of them. And the ones that are not there, they are marching there, right? So, 
No heroes, plastic heroes, false heroes. So it's not about I am, it's about he is. And the understanding of that makes us little. We have to become small because he is the only one who is. I am not. For me to be, he has to be in me. It's the only way I will be. And that we have to have so clear. If we don't get that, we are lost forever. Regardless of how much theology you have. Sometimes I see these well-groomed theologians, so manicure, so articulate. They have all kinds of credentials. Everybody respects them. They are invited everywhere. They charge a lot of money, by the way, to speak. And they are so difficult to find because they are so, so popular and so famous. They come around, they think they are. Oh, I see. What good does it do to have all of that when you didn't get the most important part? That you are not. See, he is. And that, that's the only way you will find out where you are at. If you're walking around with your chest up, thinking that you are, you are already dead. That's what you are. Because there's nothing in you. Only wind. That's what it is. So the Lord is calling us to reflect upon this reality and to understand that we are human beings created by the Creator. And therefore, He is the only one that knows what's going on. The only one. Nobody else knows it. How many times have you been confused? Oh, we can count that, right? And say how many times you went to someone asking for an answer. Could you please tell me, give me some kind of word, do this. For, in many situations in our life, we need guidance. We had questions. We needed some kind of direction. And there, deep inside our hearts, there are things that nobody can answer. There are questions that no one has. Only God will have them at the end of this life. And God is telling us, hold on, hold on. It's not time for the answer yet. If you're patient, I'm going to give it to you at the end, not now. We, we still insist and we're still frustrated because we want it now. But the thing is, God is calling us, especially through a reflection of Lent like this, to understand that our time is up. Up. Why? Because we don't know when our time is over. So that means it's up, right? Because no one here is able to say that you know how much time you have left. No one. Who's able to say that here? I know I'm going to be here one more year. Ten years. No one has the answer. Imagine how fragile our life is. How vulnerable that we cannot answer how, how much time we have left. None of us. And we know that we could be terrifyingly surprised tomorrow to find out that one of us that was here tonight just passed away during this night. So easily, right? So easily that we hear the news. You know, remember the, the lady that was sitting there on the right, on the left, and the, the one that was doing this and the other, she died last night. And it, we hear this over and over again. And, and, and it's, all, it's also the child, and it's also the teenager, and it's also doesn't matter. Death doesn't pick by ages. But we still don't get it. So one of the most important reflections is to understand that he is, I'm not. So for me to be, he has to be in me. And then how do I know how much of him I have? So the only way I could figure out how much of the one that is, is in me, so to find out how much I am, is by understanding how much I'm loving. That's the only way. Unconditional loving is the presence of God in our hearts. How do I grow spiritually? Only when I learn to love. Only. Unconditionally. Because loving, human loving is always conditional. And you know, you're always so giving, you're always so generous, but you're always keeping an account of what you're giving. And one day, you come up in a race and say, I had it. I've been giving you all my life, uh, you never came back to say thank you. You see, you are an ungrateful human being. Therefore, you never gave, because everything you gave, you kept an account of. And you were waiting to be gratified. You were waiting to be thanked. You know, that is not love. That is human love. The real love is the love that gives and forgets. And you never keep an account. You don't remember what you give, because you give it and you know it's not yours, you're just passing it along. Because what you do is you act with God and God gives through you. 
And therefore you enrich yourself with the love you give. And that is God in you. So how much of God do you have? How much do you love? Real love. Unconditional love. The love that you give and forget. That love that really, really makes sense in your heart. Because it's like Teresa of Calcutta used to say. If you want to know what charity is about, charity becomes charity when it hurts. When it hurts only. Right? If it hurts, it's charity. When you give in something and it hurts. When you make a sacrifice. When, when there is penance there. When there is mortification. When, when you have to push yourself. That's when it hurts. Because it's so easy to love those that love you. To forgive those that forgive you. To, to help those that help you. I mean, like, like the scriptures say, even the bad people do, do that. You know, even evil people do that. So, but to love those that don't love us. To just forgive those that hate us and despise us and, and slander us. To, to understand the sufferings of people even though they don't care about us. That's love. That's the real God in us. So we have to challenge ourselves. How much of God do I have in me? We can only find that out if we measure the virtues in our hearts. How tall are those virtues? And that is our aim. That is the only calling of the faith. We can read a million books. You can go through all kinds of teachings and you can go through a million retreats and you can do all kinds of spiritual exercises. But if you don't do the main one and it is to find out that you are not, then you're never going to make it, right? Because if you're still thinking that you are, regardless of what you do, you're never going to make it. And that is the biggest trap of the world because, because of original sin, we still insist that we are. So when we, we insist that we are, we are always wanting to be on control. As simple as that. Why do you want to be on control? Because you think you are. So you think you are the commander in chief. You think you are the captain of the boat. You think you are the one with the knowledge. You think you are the one that has the right ideas. And therefore, you are done for. If you die like that, you won't make it to God. You won't see Him. You won't be able to see Him. So. Today is a very important moment for us to reflect upon these mysteries and to find out who we are. If I'm not thirsty for God, then I'm in trouble. Because what good does it do to be a Catholic if I don't have the single hunger for the Eucharist? I don't feel anything for that. I don't have any hunger for the Eucharist. Who am I? What am I doing? What happens to that supernatural gift of First Communion? Where, where did it ever go? And then if I'm sitting here in this temple and I don't feel this magnificent, magnificent presence of this extraordinary God that is here with us, if I don't feel it, if I don't know it, if I'm not aware of it, every instant, every beat of my heart, every time, every single cell of my body is breathing, if I don't know that He's here, He's present, He's like, He's like everything in my life, I'm breathing in Him, He's breathing in me, He's all over. If I don't feel like that, I have to wake up because I'm dead, I'm not alive, I'm not there with the faith yet. And that would be a grace that you receive. Because this is nothing to be scared of if you find out that that's who you are. Someone that doesn't feel God's presence. Someone that doesn't have any hunger for the Eucharist. Someone that knows that it's only of the flesh and not of the spirit. That would be a great gift that the, God, that the Lord could give you tonight. Because then you will know you have to start from zero, but you will start on the right road. You will be on the right path and you will be doing the right thing because you will be building the right edifice. You will be on the right construction because it's not about time. It's about starting it because this is an eternal edifice, an eternal construction. See, God will never end. The angels of God have no clue of what's taking place in a minute from now. They don't know. God is new every instant. Is new. No one knows what he's up to. See, nobody knows. So God is eternally new. And we will be forever discovering him. So there is no rush about what we're doing. But the main thing is to find out if we are building the right building. If we are in the right construction. That's the only thing that is important. The rest doesn't matter. Because it's not about how far you are into the building. Because your building is eternal. So no rush. 
The important thing is, are you building in the right path? That is what we're talking about. Because some people are deceived by religion. And they think that because they are religious and they are in the church, they are building the right construction. Maybe not. Maybe you are living in a Pharisaic spirit. Remember, who, was, who were the most religious people in the times of Jesus? The Pharisees, the, the, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they were the most religious people. They knew everything. They were the theologians. They were always in the church. They were, they were well dressed properly for the church. And they were not spiritual. So, and they were convinced that they had it all. That they had everything with God and everything with the world. And they were wrong, completely wrong. And a lot of people like that in the church today. And, and we know that. And how many times have we, each one of us, have been like that? How many times? And we have to change. We have to come to terms with this. And be simple and humble. Because the biggest understanding is to know that God is compassionate and merciful. And if we still are here, we know that God wants us to grow. Otherwise, he will have taken us away already. That's why you see a drunkard on the, on the, in the street just on the floor there. And you have to remember, God is not true with that person. Yet, yeah, that person is still alive. So, it's until the end. Until the end. And his mercy goes all the way to the end. So, it's not too late. We can change today. This is the time of the Lord. This is, moment is the time of the Lord for us to be conscious and say, I need to do drastic changes in my life because I've been beaten around the bush. I have been fooling myself. I am just a religious human being. There is nothing spiritual about me. I'm just a Catholic that falls, follows the wind, the wind of religion. And I've never been involved with the mystic of my faith. I have to become mystical. I have to go into this depth of the gifts of the church. I have to become Eucharistic. I have to understand that God is truly alive in the host. I have to understand that I have to reconcile. I have to come to terms with peace with God by reconciling myself with Him and my neighbor. And that is a basic understanding of the healing of your inner life. Your inner life will never be at peace. You will never have joy if you do not truly reconcile. And reconciliation begins by conscientization. The interiorization of your faith is the only way that leads you to reconciliation. Because you have to reconcile till the last bone of your body. Everything has to be reconciled with God. Your little blood. Everything has to be reconciled with God. Everything. Your little thoughts your passions, your fears, everything has to be reconciled with God. And, and that is very important to bring in because He is redemption in Jesus Christ. He redeems everything. He redeems our bones. He redeems our blood. He redeems our thoughts. He redeems our feelings. Everything He redeems. He is a redeemer. But we have to bring in the goods. We have to come in with everything to Him. So, to end, I will say, the biggest question is, who am I? Who am I? What am I doing? What am I up, what am I up to? Is that is the question. It, do, do, am I acting like I am? That is a dangerous thing. Maybe I am. And then if I am, I am in bad shape. So I have to turn around and say, I'm not, Lord. I'm not. And say it a million times so that you remember. So that you can you sort of like... A, like suggest to yourself deeply in your heart that you are not you are not you are not don't make ideas of yourself because you are not and then God finally is going to come to be in your heart and finally you for the first time you're going to begin to have peace through peace and through joy because you let go finally and let God and that is the beginning of faith that's when a true transformation comes along. You stop fighting. You stop trying to control. Where does jealousy come from? From manipulation, from thinking that you are. So you have to be in control of somebody. So you're jealous. Where does envy come from? Oh, you want to have everybody, everything everybody else has. And then that's, what is that? Trying to control. You, you, you're thinking that you are. You're thinking you can control your life. And all of these fears, where do they come from? The fear of not making it, the fear of things going wrong, all of that. 
trying to control everything. Being on control. Who is on control? Only the one who is. It's the only one that knows the direction. It's the only one that has the compass. It's the only one that has the map and the navigation uh, tools. It's the only one that has those instruments of navigation and the only one that knows the direction. So therefore, if we don't anchor ourselves in the true port of God, we are going to be lost in the oceans of the world. And that is for sure. So we see so many souls being tossed and turned by the wind of this world. And it's so sad to see them like zombies going against, going after things that are unreal. Sometimes I give people the example of you watching a little dog going by really fast. And you think that dog for sure is going on a mission, right? He's going on some kind of duty. And then you, the dog passes you really fast. Then all of a sudden, the dog stops dry on his tracks right there. Goes up like this and finds a better smell and comes right back on the same direction on the opposite side, running as fast. He wasn't going anywhere. He was going after the smell. That's the dog, right? You see people like that in the shopping centers. You see people like that in the streets. They go in like this and then they stuck with a car. They stuck with a pair of shoes somewhere. They stuck with something and they look lost. They look like they, they're going after a smell. So they're going after a, a desire, a want, just like an animal, see? And we don't even notice how taken we are by want and desire. We even act like, like dogs, right? We act like those animals. We're going in this direction. And our want and desire will turn us around and send us in the opposite direction. We don't even notice how fast we change curse. We don't even notice it because we are after want and desire. And that is our animal. See, the animal part of ours. That's why the Lord is asking us to become spiritual. Otherwise, we are in the flesh. And what are the works of the flesh? Dead at the end because it will not lead us anywhere. So we have to become a spiritual so that we are not following the wind. We are on command of the wind because we were called to be the managers of creation, not the slaves of creation. And remember, if you read Genesis, you see the beginning and you see what God did with us. He gave us command of, of, the, of the material world. In command, we are in command if we live with him and for him and in him. That is the calling. So I would say the question is, who am I? And the answer is, I am not. There is only one I am, and that is God. And therefore, I have to empty myself of self. And if that will be the beginning of a true life. Not until you do that, you will begin to have peace. Because as long as you hold on to yourself, you're going to be like a dead human being, filled with fears, anger, resentments, jealousy, envy, wanting to control, wanting approval, all of that in you, a miserable, a miserable life. You will never get it. So God is asking us to empty ourselves of self so he can come in. And God will dwell in us and we will have a magnificent life. I'm going to ask the Lord to give us his word so that we can close this reflection in the spirit of the word of the Lord. And, and I'm going to read to you from the letter to the Hebrews. And it's, I begin in chapter 12. It says, accept the correction of the Lord. What a cloud of innumerable witnesses surround us. So let us be rid of every encumbrance, and especially of sin, to persevere in running the race marked out before us. Let us look to Jesus, the founder of our faith, who will bring it to completion. For the sake of the joy reserved for him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and then sat at the right of the throne of God. Think of Jesus who suffered so many contradictions from evil people, and you will not be discouraged or grow weary. Have you already shed your blood in the struggle against sin? Do not forget the comforting words that wisdom addresses to you as children. My son, pay attention when the Lord corrects you, and do not be discouraged when he punishes you. For the Lord corrects those he loves and chastises everyone he accepts as a son. 
What you endure is in order to correct you. God treats you like sons, and what son is not corrected by his father? If you were without correction, which has been received by all as is fitting for sons, you will not be sons, but bastards. Besides, when our parents, according to the flesh, corrected us, we respected them. How much more should we be subject to the Father of spirits to have life? The word of the Lord. So I praise the Lord for all of you. I thank the Lord from the bottom of my heart because each one of us here present, we are a true living stone of the temple of God. And we are very important human beings. We are a cell of the mystical body of Jesus. And through us, the Lord Jesus is going to be able to save millions of souls if we are faithful, if we are attached to that body, if we are not pretending to be, if we are part of the one who is and become one with him, with the one that is. And if we are so humble and simple and become a unity with him, we will have peace, wisdom. We will have a spiritual guidance that will be perfect through the Holy Spirit in every step of the way. And we will go home together because I will say, what is the biggest prayer tonight? Let us all meet in heaven one day. Amen.